fun. So I'm Amy Pruden. I'm a professor at Virginia Tech, and I'm a proud member of the Flint Water Study Team. So the Flint Water Study was born when a professor that I've worked very closely with on several research projects over the years, Mark Edwards, answered a phone call from a Flint mom whose child had lead poisoning. And he responded in a way that a professor with his expertise was in a unique position to do, but up until that point, nobody had stepped up to do. And since that call, we've had over 60 of our students volunteer eight-person years of effort, assembling water testing kits, driving back and forth to Flint, testing the water, reporting the results to residents. It took this kind of massive volunteer effort to reveal what was an environmental crime. The people in charge of policing the water were telling people it was safe when it wasn't. So stepping back, way back, how did I get involved? So I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and I was blessed, and I spent most of my summers up in Michigan, enjoying the lakes and forests and natural beauty. And I loved school, and as I progressed through my PhD, environmental science was a natural fit for me. I felt like every kid deserved the opportunity to grow up as I did, with plenty of fish and critters to chase after. But as I matured and learned more about the world, it was a shocking revelation to me that not only does most of the world not have the time and luxury to enjoy nature, they don't even have access to clean drinking water. Six to eight million people die every year because of water-related illness. And if you think about it, it wasn't all that different here in this country a hundred years ago or so, which is actually when most of our water infrastructure was built. And so I felt that I found my calling, and I dedicated myself to advancing the science of fighting waterborne disease. And I set off to establish myself as a scientist with the expertise to do something about these problems. But I found that to succeed as a scientist, it's really hard. <laughs> and I learned from other successful professors that it essentially boils down to two things. You publish papers in peer-reviewed journals, and you get grants to get the funding to do the science. So the basic premise is that you have to establish credibility as a scientist. And then little by little, the papers will build up the knowledge base needed to inform change in the world. But here's where it can actually get fiercely competitive and a bit of a numbers game. And it's funny, but kind of not funny, but we academics can tend to boil each other down into a set of numbers. Like, hey, there's the professor with 402 papers. And that professor has 55 papers and an H-index of 10. Here's another stat. After slogging away for five to six years on a PhD in the sciences, there can be as little as a 15% chance of landing a job as a tenure-track professor, and even less of a chance of keeping your job after that. So I stand here as one of the fortunate as for my numbers, um, I hope they're respectable, but more than that, I hope that the work that I've done matters. And two of the big problems that we've been trying to tackle is stopping the spread of antibiotic resistance and Legionnaire's disease. I feel that being a professor is truly the greatest job in the world. 
But it's, it's hard to explain sometimes the kinds of pressures that you can feel from all sides. So obviously teaching classes, mentoring students, managing a lab, writing papers, writing grants, traveling, going to conferences, giving presentations, and uh, yeah, maybe having a family in there somewhere. And I'm often asked by people, how do you do it all? And I don't know, because most of the last 15 years of my life are a blur. But essentially, I developed a system. You limit social interaction, short emails, and do not answer the phone. <laughs> Pretty much any given minute, I'm calculating in the back of my mind whether I'm working or taking care of my kids basic needs, and I had tricks. I could breastfeed a baby with one hand and type a manuscript with the other. <laughs> Another trick was going to bed at 3 a.m., getting up at 6 a.m., or fully overdosed on caffeine, just not bothering to sleep at all. But sooner or later, these things can catch up to you. And I had my wake-up call. I was driving down the turnpike in Ohio, cruise control set at 70 miles per hour, and my two little angels, my eight-year-old son and my five-year-old daughter, were fast asleep in the back of the van, and I was fast asleep at the wheel. And I thank God every day for those good citizens, complete strangers, who honked their horn, rolled down their window, and yelled at me to get off the road because they saved my life and my kids' lives, and no doubt others that happened to be driving down the road that evening. And why did I fall asleep at the wheel? I mean, simply put, I wasn't sleeping enough. I was so caught up in trying to do all that I thought I needed to do to be a successful professor that I lost touch with my humanity. And so much has gone through my mind since that day. It's like my life, the world around me are going by in slow motion. So this was July 29th, 2015. And it was over the next two weeks that our students assembled 300 water testing kits and sent them off to Flint, Michigan. And within the next month, the first van load of students arrived. Then there was a contentious town hall meeting where the results were presented and a fight ensued to keep the cover-up going. And then Dr. Mona released the results of her blood lead testing. A Legionnaire's disease outbreak was announced. The governor apologized. President Obama gave an emotional public statement. There were two congressional hearings. And slowly the tides were turned, and the water was changed back to the safer Lake Huron source. That moment on the turnpike was an awakening for me on so many levels. First, the literal awakening to the risk that I was putting on myself and my family by trying to succeed in the academic game. And secondly, to the futility of the academic game itself. I had to look myself hard in the mirror and accept the fact that if Leanne Walters, a mom like me, worried about her children, had called me instead of Mark, I would have never answered the phone. Most professors probably wouldn't. I was so caught up trying to be a successful professor that I forgot why I became a professor in the first place, because I wanted to help people. And I'm ashamed to confess this today, but I do it because I hope that somebody is listening. You might be a professor like me or anybody who's worked hard because you want to do something good for this world. Making a difference takes something more than hard work. 
It takes opening your eyes to the realities of the world around us and that what we do matters. We can make a difference. There are flints all around us. And as much as we care for our own children, if it's within our power to protect somebody else's child from harm, then it is our moral imperative to do something. So how do we make a difference? <laughs> How do we make a difference? We first have to examine ourselves, our core values. No matter what the system seems to dictate, we cannot allow our incentives to be all about chasing numbers. My core values are kids and water and good science. What are your core values? After that, wake up, open your eyes, be in the moment, slow down, and when that phone rings, be ready to answer and take action.